Hello there. Welcome back to The Bleeding Truth. My name is Sally McNally. I'm the Irish midwife. And I'm Bridget, Sally's daughter. Well, today we're talking about a very serious subject, infertility. Um, and uh, we, in, in our office where I work, we see women who have this problem all the time. We usually start out with asking them to study their own fertility. We take a history on what their periods are like and if we can identify when they're ovulating. And of course, there's there's little apps on your phone that you can follow along with and, and identify when you're ovulating. And you can check your temperature. You can look at the cervical mucus usually coming up to ovulation time it's a little cloudy and then it gets less cloudy and then the day of ovulation it's clear and strong and stretchy like egg white Um, and of course that's wonderful um, uh, sign you know that you're probably ovulating and that's only there for about 12 hours Um, and during that 12 hours it's very interesting you might notice that uh, you feel like having sex, you know, that uh, your lover looks particularly handsome during that time frame. And you might feel a little slippery when you wipe yourself. It's like more slippery than usual. And you also might feel a little feeling of openness down there. So there are signs of ovulation. And also maybe the day before or during that time frame, you might have felt a little pain from one ovary or the other where your egg was released Um, but if a woman says she she's studied her own fertility and uh, things are not what we would normally expect or she has a very irregular cycle we might then go to the next step which is hormone studies we would get labs drawn and see if her hormone levels are normal Um, or if one is lacking or there's too much of one and there's like numerous hormones we can look at we can look at our thyroid gland we can look at our ovaries Um, and then uh, after that we might send her for a pelvic ultrasound uh, to make sure that the structures are uh, normal or that something like a a tube and her Uh, tubes are not blocked sometimes a pelvic inflammatory disease can get up into the fallopian tubes and prevent the egg yeah prevent the egg from uh, coming down into the uterus some women might have huge fibroids where if she did uh, fertilize one of her eggs it wouldn't have anywhere to settle there's no soft spongy part of the uterus to embed some Another thing might be numerous ovarian cysts. Um, so there's different things that can cause uh, the, the fertility, infertility. Um, so say if we, we outrule all of that, um, then Dr. Diesfeld that I work with is very good with this. He'll uh, maybe put the lady on Clomid, which is a medication to encourage um, ovulation, to encourage the the formation of, uh, you know, a little uh, egg. Uh, the next step w- would be to study the, um, we sometimes actually study the man's uh, or the partner's sperm at the same time as we study her hormones to make sure that the sperm Maybe it's count, not her. <laughs> exactly. To make sure that the sperm count is, uh, you know, adequate. Mm-hmm. Um I have a funny story from Ireland. I remember when I was working in the gynae clinic over there, um, I worked with a Dr. Neary and Dr. Neary used to be a joker. You know, he's always playing jokes on us, but we got him back and I'll tell you about that (laughs) another day. But uh, this day I was kind of a new uh, student midwife and he was doing fertility this day. And um, the, the woman was in the clinic And he handed me a little bottle, you know, like a urine uh, specimen bottle. And he said, go out to that van that's parked in the in the uh, car park and tell that man that we want a specimen of his sperm. (laughs) So um, out I went and this lady, she was uh, one of the travelers. Sometimes we used (laughs) to call them the tinkers. and uh, they, you know, traveled around in these caravans and they, you know, but uh, usually they had huge families, you know, 12, 13, 14 children. The caravan was like full of children. <laughs> and this couple had no children. 
Oh. Yeah. So um, they were tinkers. So I went out to the van and I knocked on the window and he pulled down the window and I said, the doctor says he needs a specimen and I'm holding my little cup. And he said, a specimen of what? And I said, a specimen of your sperm. And he blew up. He exploded. He started shouting at me and cursing at me. Oh my gosh. That it wasn't him. And get that woman fixed for him quick. And all of this. And I I just uh, turned around and I walked back into the clinic terrified. And um, when I went back in, there they all were standing at the window, bursting laughing, including Dr. Neary. They were laughing at me because it was like one of those tricks you'd play on the new nurse. <laughs> Very funny. They knew he was going to be blown up about it. Yeah. Oh, man. And, oh, yeah. They were funny. Another trick they played on me uh, one time when I went to the gynae unit, I reported uh, brand new, and I said... Hello, I'm Sally Hartigan, was my name at the time. I'm Sally Hartigan, and uh, this is my first day here on the gynae unit. And they said, oh, good, you're here. Go to the lab and ask for some fallopian tubes, quick. (laughs) And I didn't think. And I ran to the lab and I said, they need some fallopian tubes, quick. (laughs) I don't think you can get those in the lab. (laughs) <laughs> oh yeah so that showed how much i was paying attention to being yeah. to me um the next thing we would do after the clomid once we get her like a good egg um and she's ready she's ovulating we're sure she's going to ovulate and um, we can try a, in a insemination artificial insemination which is to bring mm-hmm. the couple in and to get a fresh specimen of sperm and to spin it uh, with a special solution and uh, then inseminate that in uh, to the uterus. And it's very easy. It's kind of like a a procedure, like a pap. um, And it's like a little pipette and it's it's very easy. And some of the ladies might think, oh, it's so so invasive, but it's honestly, it's very quick. It's very easy. And we usually get her to totally relax, you know, her body and her mind and to visualize, you know, the the egg and the sperm coming together inside her body. And uh, we do like a little, you know, meditation and visualization with her. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, that's very exciting. Then when she comes back, you know, next month pregnant and it's it's all very exciting for the whole office. Um, So then uh, after that, so a lady might go for that a few times. And if it's not successful, then, of course, she'll go to fertility specialists who would uh, then do in vitro fertilization. Uh, Mm. So they would create an embryo in the, the lab and then insert that embryo into her body. And that's our conversation today with this wonderful patient of mine, Nicole. She's so sweet and she's uh, been through this long journey of infertility and she's willing to come and share her story with us. And in the hopes that it can help women out there who are trying to get pregnant and inspire women um, to, you know, keep going, to keep going that uh, absolutely. Yes, that they will be successful like she was. And so thank you guys for tuning in to another episode. Um, Please like and subscribe if you get the chance. And if you're on Apple uh, listening to us there or on Spotify, please make sure to leave a review as well because that really helps the podcast out. Um, So thank you guys for the support and let's get into it. Yes, thank you. And today we have a very special lady joining us, a powerful woman, Nicole Eberhardt. She is a Venturi yoga teacher here at Grassroots. She is the owner of multiple small businesses and uh, just recently opened a brand new shop and we're all going, yay. You'll have to tell us all about that, Nicole. Yeah. But uh, especially we wanted Nicole to come and talk to us today about a subject that can be so painful for some women, um, Mm -hmm. infertility. Um, Nicole, would you like to share your journey with us today? We would love to hear it. Yes, I would love to. Um, And I may get emotional because it is 
an emotional thing. I already am. Oh, <laughs> That's yes. We'll, we'll work on that. Um, yes. So I do want to say that my journey is like no one other. So like anything that my doctor had me doing, um, I should say doctors, because there were multiple, um, had me doing is going to be very different from protocols um, mm. or experiences than others. No one in fertility journey is the same as the other. Yeah. And one beautiful thing I will say before I start is that the friendships I have gained through this journey are incredible. The, while no journey is the same, there is a tribe of women out there and it is just it's a beautiful thing. Um, so, um, I mean, where do you start? So my journey started, um, <laughs> I mean, when you get your period, right? <laughs> and I have always had awful, just not good periods. And I've sort of struggled mm -hmm. with that my whole life. Um, no diagnosis on why or how, um, just the solution of good old birth control. And when I got into my thirties, I also only, I made this awful joke my whole life. If my periods have always been this awful and I find out I can't have kids, oh, I'm going to wow. be really oh. What way do you mean awful, like painful or? Oh, great question. Um, very heavy and very mm. long. Painful. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Like prescribed Motrin, um, higher doses of Motrin to try to help, um, super ultra plus tampons my whole life. Um, wow. yeah. And long, unfortunately, very long, um, which come to find out, I did not know this. It's just the phase before your period. I have, my hormones are off. So like I would oh, have this okay. prior wow. to that. Interesting. Yeah. And Sally's like, yes. <laughs> um, and, um, and so the birth control, which I'm trying to rein back in right now, actually, if you will, um, to try to help that again, because it did end up coming back after having a baby as well. Oh, bummer. Yeah, yeah. So so the um, happy ending, though, is that you you did manage to get pregnant, right? And I, do have, have a I do have a very handsome little son. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, and so I, you know, spent my whole life trying to avoid these periods and getting pregnant, honestly. Mm -hmm. When I met my husband, we always talked about having a big family. We talked about adoption. We talked about families. We talked about all of it. And, you know, a year into our relationship, kind of recklessly, we said, well, if we get pregnant, I was, I've been there seven years. I'm 39. So I was 32, you know? And so I said, you know, if I get pregnant, I'm going to have the baby anyways. And he said, well, if you get pregnant, I'm going to be really happy. So Aww. we just sort of, about a year, year and a half into the relationship, yeah. stopped using birth control because I also wanted to rid my body of those hormones. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so I did. And uh, I never got pregnant. And honestly, I don't, I didn't know that I wasn't getting pregnant because there was going to be something wrong. I just thought we were avoiding it like magic king yes. and queen. Somehow. Like the yeah. terrible timing. <laughs> yes, exactly. Um, and so I just, you know, and I also didn't fully, you know, I'll say it out loud. I did not fully understand they teach you in school that you can get pregnant anytime. And really it's not that window true. Is, yeah. It's not true. Yeah. That window is especially as you get older, the window is shorter. Yes. <laughs> um it's it's very short. And so like I remember before we got married, I was we had done the deed and I was like, I'm gonna do a handstand, you know, I'm gonna put my legs up the wall, I'm gonna do all the the wives' tales, and none of them ever worked. And I don't know that I was ever doing this things at the appropriate time anyways you know right so it wouldn't have worked yeah, <laughs> yeah. no it worked anyways but like yeah. you know you think you fully understand how it works until you start trying or until you start mm -hmm. tracking and still you you know start and I was seeing Dr. Diesfeld um the doctor that works in Sally McNally's office and um oh actually I should start back I was seeing a different gynecologist and I had she was like all right let's get you pregnant let's do some tests um, and I went and had the blood work done and never got a call from the office to tell me about anything that the blood work had said. And so I called and this random lady pulls up the information and goes, oh yeah, everything looks fine. And I was like, okay, sounds good. Um, and then month after month after month, cause we had yeah. been married at that point. And mm -hmm. so like month after month after month, it just wasn't happening. Yeah. And so I would call their office and say, can I please come see her? I need to understand what's happening. Um, it's not working. And I would be in my fit of, you know, despair essentially when I would be calling. And 
um, oh yeah, we'll see you in eight weeks, 12 weeks, et cetera. But I had already been going through this. And when you're going through this month after month, it starts to like really break you down. Mm-hmm. And so that's when I found Dr. Deesfeld. I had a friend who was going there and she was like, go see him. I think you'll like him. And so I did. And they repeated all the blood work and everything. And, you know, he did say some of your numbers don't look awesome, but they're not terrible, you know? So let's, let's have you try a few more months just based on what he was telling me. Um, so I did, and then, um, it didn't work. (laughs) And so he was said, okay, let's do, since it's been an additional two to three months, let's do a saline ultrasound. And so that's where they go in, um, with, we call her Wanda. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. The infertility community calls her Wanda. She is an internal, a vaginal uh, ultrasound. And it's it's like a wand, a giant wand with a condom on it. <laughs> and I have had so many of those in my life. I thought they were normal for women. And now when I speak to other women about things, they're like, oh, uh, I have to have that awful thing. And I was like, I thought everybody had that. <laughs> Turns out it was just me. <laughs> just me. Uh, and so in the saline ultrasound, uh, they put water inside of your... Um, inside of your vaginal canal into your uterus and then they put Wanda back in so that they can blow everything up because your uterus is naturally closed. Mm -hmm. Please, Sally, if I have any of this wrong, correct. It's great. It's perfect. (laughs) Okay. And so the saline makes it like this and then you can see what's going on in there. Yeah. Um, And so when they did that, they saw that I had what they call synechia, synechia. Um, And it's scar tissue that's connecting the sides of my uterus together to oh wow yeah and so um dr Deesfeld said let's go in and we'll remove it <laughs> my husband and i called it the slingshot so like when he would ejaculate it would just slingshot it back out so it never made it into the, <laughs> the, the uterus. Uh, <laughs> oh my gosh <laughs> yeah so we had that done in january i had uh, the saline ultrasound in november and then in january we did the procedure we wanted to wait to after the new year because i bumped my insurance up because i could tell some things were going to be needed um and so i got the procedure done like literally like january 3rd or something and he he removed all of the the scar tissue and it's not endometriosis that's different right. so this usually comes from either um, abortions or miscarriages. And to, I had never had an abortion because um, I had never been pregnant <laughs> that I knew of. And um, he did say that there may have been chances that I was having miscarriages that I didn't know I was having. Um, oh, wow. Yeah, because there's really that's where they found where those two for that to come from. Um, and again, like I said, I hadn't had an abortion and I didn't know that I was having miscarriages. So they removed it and he was like, let's have you try a few more months. So I tried a few more months and that's when Sally McNally came on board to the office <laughs> and I showed up bawling my eyes out. And he said, Uh-oh. actually the both of them said to me, what do you want to do next? And that's when they offered the IUI. Um, so IUI is essentially artificial insemination, but with your partner or adopted sperm. So it's, it works really well with like LGBTQ families as well, because they can adopt the sperm mm-hmm. uh, and then choose the mother and go from there or adopt an embryo, which is a whole nother thing. Um, and so we did two IUIs with Dr. Deesfeld. Sally was there for them. Um, it was, I thought, I thought she was my good luck charm because she's the Irish midwife and I was so happy <laughs> to meet her. Um, and it was my, Irish, my Irish good luck charm. Those two just unfortunately oh. didn't work. <laughs> um, and so I, um, he said at that point, you know, it was time to go seek additional, additional help. And I had had some friends going through it. And so I had found, um, Dr. Bulos, he's at Fertility, uh, Surgical Associates in Thousand Oaks. He's really actually, he's kind of world known for his methods and he teaches all around the world. So I felt really lucky um, to have found him. Now, I must say the financial burden started to um, take toll. I didn't even think of that. So expensive. Yes. So expensive. The IUIs, they're great in and outs. If you do them with your doctor's office. um, Oh gosh, that was a whole other thing. When I was doing them with the doctor's office. I was hearing from my friends at the clinic that were doing them a certain way. And Dr. Deesfeld did his 
his clinicals in a fertility clinic back in 1983, which is so incredible. And, um, and so he had like, he had history doing this. And so what I found was that his process totally, um, different from my fertility doctor's process, neither is right or wrong. Like I said, at the beginning of this, they, everybody kind of has their way of doing things. Um, and so the financial thing started to come into play and I was like, let's do one. We've met with, um, Dr. Bulos. We call him Dr. B. And he was like, let's do an IUI, you know, your, your egg number and your egg quality are both, they're not low, but they're, well, they're low. They're, but they're not like detrimental. Like, I think we can still do this. And so we did an uh, IUI with him and, um, in September, I'm gonna cry. <laughs> uh, in that September, I had gotten pregnant for the first time in my yes. life. And yes. It was, <laughs> It was the most beautiful thing in the world because I knew it could happen Um, because I had spent so much of my life thinking that I couldn't, you know, because it just kept not working. And so we got pregnant and we had our first ultrasound and we saw, (laughs) we saw our little heartbeat and I actually don't know that it was a girl, but you feel it was a girl. Yeah. I feel it in my heart. I had dreams about her. I still have dreams about her. Uh, and so she, we saw her heartbeat and he was like, this is amazing. Everything is looking really, really good. And so we went out and we celebrated and we kept going. And then I went in for my eight week ultrasound. And when I got in there, they handed me, this is how confident they were. Let's just say this. They handed me a, um, like a survey to fill out. Like, yeah. how did you do your service here? Um, and so I like filled it out and then Dr. B came in and, um, Gary was in the room with me, my husband, by the way, he's been through, he has been to every appointment thus far. Like it's, he's been very involved in everything. And, um, and so like, right when they put Wandy in, um, it was just like the room went black. I, it went black. I honestly don't remember really what yeah. he had said. And so, uh, they just said, let me know that she didn't, she didn't keep growing. Um, and so, um, Again, I don't, I don't really remember what he said. So and I asked my sad. husband. So hard. Really, yeah. And so I asked my husband all the time, you know, what did he say? And he tells me what he said. And then I, I still, I still don't really remember. Wow. Um, and so at that point I had said, I, I just can't keep doing it like this. Um, and with IUIs, the unfortunate part of them, while they are such a great financial option for people because they are so much more cost effective, um, the success rate of IUIs is like 19%. Um, Gary's sperm, I do want to say, was never the problem. That man at the age of 40, whatever he is, has incredible sperm to the point where Dr. D. Stell goes, uh, tell me to be careful with that stuff on the around the church. Four is being everyone that can get pregnant. I was I looked at him and I was like, hey. and he was like, oh, God. Oh. <laughs> oh. I had to. I come from a family of terrible jokers. Right. He's so um, funny too. Yeah, like Gary, the first test we had done outside of the office through an acupuncturist. Actually, she had ordered it. Um, he totally botched it and messed it up and like oh. barely sent the correct sperm and like, Oh no, didn't transfer it. Right. He sent barely any, and he still had like millions of sperm. And when I say men, when they're looking for sperm counts, they like to see like at least 25 million yeah. <laughs> or hoping for like one or two eggs, you know, and this, yeah. this is like literally 150 million sperm count. Like sperm count. <laughs> That's crazy. Wow. That's great. <laughs> yeah. He has really, it's not him. Let's just say that. Um, so, <laughs> terrible anyway I had, to, I had to move it light again um so at that point um they said you know what do you want to do and, and my fertility doctor actually recommended doing another IUI and I said that I didn't think that I could because if I got pregnant again if I do have lower quality eggs then the chances of it not being successful again are are lower and or are higher excuse me and um I just didn't feel like that was something that I could do again. And so it's an emotional burden. Totally. Like, like, yeah, yeah. the fear of, yeah, you know, and that works for people. Like, you know, there are women out here there that do do any fertility treatments and have 
sadly repeat miscarriages and they, you know, keep going and that's what yeah. works for them. But for me, it just, didn't, it didn't feel like something that I could do. Um, and so I, um, at that point had made the decision to move to IVF. Um, and financially at the time we were, we could figure out how to make it work. Let's just say that. And so, so we, IVF, just to clarify, some people oh, yeah. may not know that's in vitro fertilization. So yes, tell us yes. about that, Nicole. So that is a much more strenuous uh, process and that will only be done by like a fertility specialist. And that um, is entails where um, I will say one more thing about the miscarriage. I had to wait until the miscarriage had fully um, processed. Yeah. Moved through, if you will. Um, and it took me 10 weeks. Dear girl, I can see uh, the baby did move through the uterus, but not through your heart yet. Baby's no. still so much there. Yeah. And it's important. She has a shrine in her house above she, the baby's yeah. bed. And yeah. We've named her Bertie May. Yeah. She has a name. Um, oh. And yeah. <laughs> and so we say goodnight to her when we go to bed at night. Yeah. Uh, and um, so it took me cry. like, I know it's a lot. Um, and I appreciate your heart in that, that, you know, it's very sweet because usually when you meet people and you tell them these stories, you get to hear, unfortunately, about all their stories, um, yeah. and they're never good. Or they're the stories that say, oh, you know, my sister-in-law did that. And then she got pregnant naturally and she has six kids. Oh. You're like, yeah, I did that. I took breaks. I, I stopped trying. I drank more wine. I did all, I ate raspberries. I put the thing in the corner of the, the baby shoes in the corner of the room. I, I yeah. did all, of, I did all of I the know. things and they didn't work, you know? And so we had made the decision to go to IVF at that point. And it took, I wasn't able, we, we lost Birdie May on October 9th. Um, and I found out I was pregnant with her on September 18th and we lost her on, um, October 9th. And so he decided to not do, um, and this can be sensitive. So if it's something that we don't want to talk about, just let me know. Um, he decided not to do a DNC. He thought with the way that she had progressed, um, from the last ultrasound, that it was something that my body could do naturally. Right. And so and I what had is, to, what is a DNC? A DNC, DNC is like a dilation. If they dilate the cervix, and curatage, dilation, curatage, and the curatage is where they just use a little instrument to scrape off the mm. walls of the uterus and uh -huh. take all the products of conception, anything that is included yeah. in that gotcha. pregnancy. And then the yeah. body resets then to menstruating and ovulating. Yeah. Gotcha. Um, and so I had to take abortion pills. And I know that's a sensitive thing right now. Um, but if not, my body may not have processed what it needed to do to rid those products, as she calls them. Um, and so I got the pills and decided I wasn't going to do it until the next day. And I went to get a facial that morning. <laughs> I had the appointment and I texted her beforehand and I was like, there was something you can't do um, when you get a facial when you're pregnant, it's like an electromagnetic thing to help clear out your pores or something. Oh, yeah. And so I texted her beforehand just so I could rip the bandaid off. So I didn't have to tell her while I was in there, I said, you can do that while I'm there. And then she just, you know, sent her beautiful text message and I went in um, and it could take a long time. That's why I couldn't do it after the ultrasound I had because it was later in the day and the pills didn't come. And, um, and so I went and did my thing and in the morning and then, like the next four days was just like, it was, I don't know. I don't really remember. I mean, I, re I unfortunately remember it was awful, but um, we just, Gary stayed home with me for the four days and we just were in the house while I dealt with it. Um, and then it took like another, so we lost her on October 9th and I wasn't able to do the IVF process until December, like mid December. That's how long the miscarriage wow. had taken for me. Wow. And it was, it was continuing. That's why they didn't just yeah. stop it. You know? It was progressing. It was just slower. Mm -hmm. um, 
and I was actually just talking to a friend. I had gone in and I had to do blood draws like every couple of days. And um, with one of the blood draws, it was Halloween. And the girl comes in and I was anxious, like every blood draw, because I just wanted to see those numbers at zero so that I could move on in my process. And she could tell I was nervous. And she said, did you already test? And I said, test for what? And she said, did you take a pregnancy test this morning? And I was like, I'm not, I'm not here for pregnancy test. I am here to see if my HCG is lowering because I had a miscarriage and she was dressed as taco sauce because it was Halloween. She was just like, yeah. And I was like, I have to tell taco sauce that I had a miscarriage. (laughs) Oh, (laughs) I was just like so upset because like, why couldn't she have just looked at my chart? You know, like what did there and and they do hcg tests there a hundred times a day and so like why can't you just take the moment to look or just don't comment don't ask they've taken a test did she say sorry or anything about that or yeah she did yeah Yeah, she did but i did talk to the the head nurse about it was like this is something that if that would have happened a week or two earlier i probably would have lost it yeah um but each week gets easier and each day gets easier. But as you can see, it's still. Oh, so yeah. raw. Still, it's right there. It's right there. Yeah. yeah. Right at the surface. And so in December, we. But um, it's also, remember, Nicole, it's love in a different yeah. form. It's it's love. Yes. And I, um, I get to carry her with me always. She was yeah. part of my body and my body has changed because she was part of me. Yes. Or is part of me. And um, she and brought so, the good news. You really can get pregnant. Yeah. She brought yeah. that good news to you. She did. And so I um, have learned to be like very grateful for her and what she was able to give me. Started the IVF process. And in my protocol, I can't even list off, <laughs> to be honest with you, I can't even list the medications. But you you take a very large amount of hormones Um Some of them are to make it so that you grow multiple follicles, which will then hold your eggs. Um, And then there are the ones that follow that have you sort of hold on to that quantity of eggs and let those ones grow and mature. So the way that my doctor does it is he believes is there's quality in um, quantity, not quantity and quality quality that's not the right saying but like he's not trying to make everybody get 75 eggs or 30 you want like two or three good yes exactly yes so he had seen my follicles and said i think we'll be able to get nine or ten and so i my husband praise him he was a emt so although I never had to give myself not one shot, he did all of the shots in my stomach and you alternate from side to side and you so pinch good. it, you ice it. And he did it. He did it all. He did it all for the IUIs and he did it all for wow. IVF as well. And so, and there are like a lot a day. Um, and mind you, this is mid COVID. <laughs> this is all oh, like, wow. <laughs> I lost the baby in 2019. Um, and so in January uh, or in December of 2019, we started our IVF protocol and it, there's over a few weeks and you go in what feels like every day and you get scans to see how the follicles are developing. And that's when they start to change the protocol. So, um, and they're all human growth hormones. So like mm-hmm. it's to get your follicles to grow. It's to suppress your hormones. It's to get them to go back up. You're like constantly fluctuating with the different types of meds. Um, and for me, I was just on the hormones. I wasn't on any, um, intrapolid, intrapoloid infusions, any of that stuff. It was just mostly just the injections. Um, and were your emotions very volatile at that time? You know, what's very interesting, Sally is they weren't, it was like, I had almost, they were, it was like, they were balancing me Yeah. to do their job. And so with the IUIs, I was on Clomid, um, and it, I had grown like a huge cyst and like all the, the it just in my breast. And so I had to have a mammogram in the middle of all of it. Yeah. Um, oh, wow. You get to know that I'm clear because I am older, so it's yeah. all good. Um, and then the Clomid, everybody was like, the Clomid's so awful. But 
it just really wasn't that bad for me. And that's the one that they give you just to grow your follicles before an IUI. There's that one and another one that they use for breast cancer. And I cannot, it starts with an L, like Lupron or something. I don't know. Um, do you know, know the other one? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, we did the other one with my IUI for Dr. Dr. B, um, the breast cancer drug. And so it was interesting to see how those two affected me differently. But honestly, that those meds and the meds for the IVF, I didn't feel I didn't feel so roller coasty like yeah. a lot of women feel mm -hmm. with those meds. Um, the med that actually messed me up was estrogen, which I'll talk about when you get on that. But like <laughs> that one got me. Um, and so what happens is you, you get you get monitored, and then they'll go in and they'll do a retrieval. And when you do a retrieval, you go under. Um, and they, prior to that, you go under, no, just kidding. You go prior, you go under for the retrieval and they'll also do a biopsy during the retrieval as well of your uterus of the lining to make sure that it's healthy to yes. carry a baby. Gotcha. Um, so to do that, and I'm sure I'm going to miss parts, just everybody out there, just know that I'm going to miss things. Cause this is going to help like, so many women. Uh, you know, honestly, yeah, this is yeah. so good. I'm learning so much too. I don't know any of this. So. <laughs> yeah. yeah. They go in and they do the retrieval where they go in with a tiny uh, catheter and they pull out from the follicles your um, eggs. Mm -hmm. And so he had found 14, um, but only 10 were mature enough to move through the process. Um, and so they take the sperm donation from the partner or the um the adoption and they marry it with the eggs. Now there's two different ways that they can do it. They can put it into the Petri dish and um, put the egg with sperm and the sperm can do its job that it would do inside of the uterus there in the Petri dish, or they do what is called ICSI where they inject the sperm into the egg. So they take the tiniest oh, wow. of needle with the sperm loaded up and they inject it into the needle and, or into the egg. And then they, they essentially force it to happen. So we had eight embryos that we had decided to um, send off to genetic testing. Um, and it takes about two weeks. And so right at the end of that two weeks was New Year's Eve and or the New Year's weekend. And Gary and I were like, I think we got to get out of town. But it was it was mid COVID. And so we found this little place up in Santa Inez and we watched all <laughs> all of the Star Wars movies. And we um, just waited for Dr. B to call and let us know the results from our genetic testing. Now I will say um, genetic testing, it does test for a lot of things, but there are things that are new genetic disorders that they don't know about yet or can't test for or don't know what to look for in the test. Um, and so it's not a perfect process, the genetic testing, but it does, it really does help you understand the embryos that you have, the quality of them, and then where to go from there. Um, and so it was something that we chose to do. Um, so we got the call. We were in um, Santa Inez, this little house, and we... Um, found out that we had two healthy embryos out of the eight. Um, yeah. So it's interesting to know that yeah. you can go from this plethora. Um, and if I hadn't tested them, that would be six additional chances for a miscarriage. And oh, wow. Yeah. Because there was something very genetically wrong, unfortunately, with yeah. all six embryos. Um, to the point where it was like Down syndrome, trisomies, um, wow. one they couldn't gender. It had been that, mm -hmm. um, not good. <laughs> and so they can actually look for the gender as well. Yes. Um, and you can choose not to know and you can choose to know. And at that time, um, <laughs> for some reason I said, no, um, I didn't want to know the gender. And my husband was like, <laughs> we, don't, we don't. And I was like, no, I don't want to know. And so, um, <laughs> we finished up our vacation and we were happy to know that we had gotten to, um, and there are, you know, there are women who go in with all eight and find out that all eight are genetically normal. Mm -hmm. There, you just, you really don't know. I have a friend who retrieved seven eggs. She got three um, embryos to day five and all three tested healthy. Um, and so you just, you just really never know. Um, and her story is her story. So I'm not going to continue on that one, but I just wanted to like show the, the variation. Yeah, it could be different. You can send eight at a time. You can send more than eight at a time, but 
the price is just very different. So they do like a yeah. chunk of eight. And I just so happen to have eight. So we did our eight and we got two and um we started the transfer protocol that in that moment. Um because I had already started my period after the retreat. Mm -hmm. And so they said, you know, we may not have your results in time, but we're confident that you at least have one or two um, that will be healthy. So we can at least start with the transfer protocol or we can wait until your next cycle. And I was like, get me pregnant. <laughs> <laughs> Need to be pregnant. I was kidding. Um, and so believe it or not, that January 18th. Um, oh, I do want to say too, when I went in to get my baseline scan the next day, <laughs> um, I gave in and was like, please tell me the gender of the <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, um, honestly there was a moment there of like i had to process that as well because both of our mm. embryos were boys yeah. and mm. i really truly believed that i had lost a girl and i didn't this know was that your chance for a girl and it was yeah. i felt like i was trying to make up something so yes sally i yeah. was like trying to get a second chance at her you know yeah. mm had yeah. to process her again, unfortunately, and say, like, I'm not going to be able to have you in my arms. Yeah. I can have you in my heart and have you in my life. But it's just, it's, and even if I had another girl, it wouldn't have been the same anyways, because yeah. my girl would have been her own soul. That's right. That's right. You know? Yeah. Yeah. So I had my Reiki master come over <laughs> to the house because <laughs> I needed to, like, I had to shed a lot, you know, it was still very raw. Like, was I ready to be pregnant again? Um, was I going to be able to do it? And, um, when I got married, my sister threw my bachelorette party and I'm not, I'm not like the bachelorette kind of girl. I'm like, let's sit around a circle and make things together. <laughs> <laughs> we made, um, we made, uh, dream catchers and I made mine, um, out of all this beautiful blue, um, yarn and it was hanging in the baby's room. And, um, so she came into the house and she helped me clear the energy in the room. She helped me clear the, the stuff that I didn't need to hold on to anymore. Mm -hmm. I will always have her, but there was just like the, you know, the grief and I'll always have the grief, but there's just, I needed to open the space for this new embryo for this new baby this little boy who deserved like a real chance, not mm -hmm. me trying to make up for something, you know? Yeah. Right. And, um, the dream catcher was in the room and at the end she was like, so tell me about that dream catcher. And I said, what about it? She said, well, where did it come from? And I said, I made it on my, my, um, my bachelorette party. My sister had like done all these things. And I want you to know that my sister brought a rainbow of colors. She didn't just bring uh, blue. Yeah. Yeah. And you can buy into this or not, but I fully, I fully buy into it. Um, and she's like, you, she's like, that was glowing as soon as we walked into the room. You were weaving your sons together as part of your life with Aww. at your bachelorette party. And I was like, oh God. I love that. I yeah. Love and so that. in the baby's room and she came and she helped me and, you know, we moved past it. I had like the dog's crates in there because they're crate trained. And she was like, let's move those out. Let's like, make this your space. And I had started a company while I was going through infertility called Fiberco. And I make lavender eye pillows, heat pads, yes. and home goods. Like, oh, wonderful. Um, and so she's Lavender's like, Lavender's lovely in labor. It is. Lavender. Remember, I brought the little pillow? Yes. And, um, and so I, um, had been sewing in there and she was like, you're creating in here. So keep going with that, but like remove the outside stuff. So I would sit in there and I would just sew for days on end. Um, and so I, cause it was COVID. So like, I wasn't really working as much. Right. And so, um, we did the transfer on January 18th and about nine days later, you go in for a blood draw. Now there are women who test and take pregnancy tests the entire time and watch their line get darker or not get darker. Um, but I didn't have it in me. I was too scared. I have been totally traumatized by pregnancy and ovulation test kits. No yes. more. for me. Yeah. <laughs> And so we went in and I had taken the day off work because the studio had like started to open a little bit and I had taken the day off the work and Gary and I were just trying to keep ourselves busy. I went as early as I could. Um, 
And the nurse was texting me the whole day, like, you're, don't worry, I'll let you know as soon as your results come. And she texted me at like 1230, I think it was. And um, she didn't text me. It was like a random number. And it's mm. it was something to open. And now the millennial brain in me, because I don't know how I'm millennial, but somehow I'm millennial, <laughs> was like, it's going to be not good for your phone. To get it's spam. <laughs> sitting at the light to turn into my neighborhood and I clicked it and it opened it and it said, congratulations, you're pregnant. And I just started crying, but we're sitting at this red light and my husband's like, why are you crying? What's happening? I didn't tell him that I had opened it. So I, I handed him the phone and he was like, you kind of got to drive. And I was like, I don't, I don't think I can. And when I tell you not the light to stop at, people are angry at the light. <laughs> I, like pull in neighborhood and I just stop and then we just are in the car together and we're just like hugging and crying and Aww. just so excited yeah. and, and then you do what you can to keep the excitement and not let the fear come in um and part Such of our beautiful moment it really uh, was if only every baby could be welcomed like that huh it's so great Yes, that's the hard thing with infertility, infertility is you hear these stories of, you know, babies who aren't welcomed in, in that sort of way. And, you know, it's not to say that their stories don't matter. It's just that's what's so hard is, you know, I had to pay upwards total of everything altogether. It was like all the treatments, all the acupuncture, all the doctor's visits, everything was like $35,000 to have this baby. Wow. Yeah. Wow. IVF in itself is, is around like 25 to 30. Mm -hmm. um, um, you know, you go through your pregnancy and you just hope and wish and pray. And I remember our first appointment, I was like, I got this first appointment because I made it through the first appointment last time. And so I was like, I know that this will be okay. And so, and there was also a comfort in knowing that he was genetically tested, knowing I wasn't going to, because most miscarriages happen from a genetic disorder. It's your body saying, it's just not time. This isn't the, you know, the right thing for you. And so your body will rid itself of that pregnancy. And, and so, um, you just do your best to try to stay like positive and say like, my body can do this. My body can do this. Mm -hmm. I made it through the first appointment and it's COVID. So he can't, Gary can't come in with me anymore. Oh. Um, and so they let him come to the transfer. I will say my, my Dr. B said, there's no way I'm letting my patient get pregnant without their partner. <laughs> and so he's able to come right. in. <laughs> and you get to watch it happen. They use a small catheter and they put it up. You take a Valium to calm yourself down. Um, and then they put a catheter up inside your uterus. They, the embryologist comes in and says, here's your baby. Here's, here's your baby. And it's the tiniest cell form. Um, and he wow. was, he was hatching at that point because our eggs do hatch. Our embryos do hatch. And never thought of that. <laughs> I know. Right. And I remember texting her after and going, my embryo was lumpy and other embryos I've seen aren't as lumpy. Does that mean something's wrong with him? And she was like, no, he has more cells. Like his cells are building up. And I was like, oh, okay. Thank God. Um, and so was big from the beginning. <laughs> so, oh gosh. He's. <laughs> Um, and so he, <laughs> he, I'm, I'm the eight week appointment is when you graduate and that's when I would have graduated with the last pregnancy as well. And so I did have a panic attack and I texted the nurse and I was like, can I please just bring Gary in with me? I'm not, I'm not doing okay. And she was like, yes, absolutely. Just bring him in. So we snuck him into the room and, um, I believe it was the same room that I found out that I lost Bernie May in. And so I was like sweating and it just was a lot. Um, and so, you know, he was great and we graduated and that's when we started seeing, wow. um, it took me until about five or six months until about viability for me to be like, okay, this is really happening. You are yeah. going to be, he <laughs> is okay. Um, that's so much stress. Yeah. Too, though. That's a lot of yeah. worry on your shoulders that whole time. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And what about uh, when you would feel him moving inside or when you could see him moving on the ultrasound? Yeah, each ultrasound just felt safer and safer. Wonderful, uh, yeah. yeah. And every time he would move and um, I would just feel better. And, um, you know, he wasn't, I had a um, 
is it called anterior placenta? Yes. Yes. I had the one front where you can't like really feel as much. Yeah. Um, and so I felt him. I absolutely felt him. And he, you know, he situated himself so perfectly and he grew so perfectly in my pregnancy. Wow. It wasn't easy. Um, <laughs> I would give anything to be pregnant again. Um, I loved it so much. I just loved having him. And there was a point with this where it became about becoming pregnant. And after I had had him, after he had come out and there was that whole slew of stuff that happened, um, I had to like mourn not being pregnant anymore. There was like yes. the part yes. of where I had to be like, right. you did it, but you're no longer that. And while right. I, you had a baby who was everything that you worked so hard for, you don't get to carry him and protect him inside of you. Or you don't get to hold on. You kind of have to let them out to go. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Because it, the real goal is to have a baby, but to exactly. get to that, you have to get pregnant. And you, so your focus was on getting pregnant. And then once you were pregnant, you loved yeah. it. Yeah. I love you yeah. so much. Um, you, it's, it's almost like when, when you want something so bad and yeah. you can't have it for so long, it yeah. makes you cherish it even more. Exactly. Yeah. Like so you know, much more. All babies are precious, but yeah. we're inclined to call your your situation. We say this is a precious baby when yeah. we're talking to each other. You know, yeah. with me or Doctor D or with the other midwives, we would say this is a precious baby, so that we know the language to speak with you. Mm -hmm. So yeah. that you don't come in and say, "Well, your HCG is blah." blah. We know how important it is. Yeah. To you. Yeah. Wow. It's kind of a sensitive situation. Very. But um, all babies are precious. But, you know, I did end up getting postpartum depression and I didn't realize I had it until yeah. um, everybody around me was like, what's going on? And I remember a picture of my husband and my son, Jameson is his name, together and like not recognizing, I honestly, either of them. Um, yeah. And I was just, I just had become so numb and it was, you know, his, my birth story was great. The, the after part wasn't so awesome, you know, losing all the blood and everything. But, um, and Sally, you warned me, you said you've lost a lot of blood. We need to watch out for postpartum depression mm -hmm. because of what your body has mm -hmm. gone, gone through. And Gary, and I talked about it all the time and I was like, no, I'm fine. No, I'm fine. And he, you know, yeah. I didn't, I didn't realize he was like, I don't think you are fine. Yeah. Um, and so I ended up going on meds and I'm off them now. I've been off them for a while. And Jameson is um, going to be 11 months on the third. Wow. Yeah. And when Sally says that he is a huge child, um, he's moving into two T clothes. <laughs> he's in the hundred percentile of everything. His dad is sick. <laughs> so he's a, he's a large, but such a soft and loving kind. Yeah. Oh, little man he's just a little man and he reality yeah. is incredible and he's a thinker um like me he we went over to the family's house last night and he it takes him like a good 10 minutes to study everything and then yeah. feel cool and start playing and yeah. i feel like some people are like a why is he so behind meaning why isn't he walking or talking or etc because of his height um He's only 10 months old right now. Um, but then also people are always like, why is he so, you know, stoic? And I remember during the, <laughs> not exactly after during the um, parenting classes, they said babies react to things in two ways um, to stress. They either cry the heck out of things and scream their bloody head off or they're like stoic. And that's what Jameson does. And I know that means that he's stressed. So that no, I know that means that it's time mm. to protect him, yeah. you know, keep him safe, keep him close. So he's happy. Um, it's just interesting and so beautiful to like learn all of these things about him um, yes. and watch him be his own little person. And I thought the opinions during fertility were awful, but the opinions about parenting are really bad. <laughs> 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 um, <laughs> But it is what it is. Every it honestly it comes from like a place of love with people. Mm -hmm. So I'm not. I don't get mad at anybody. I just have to like. I get asked almost daily. So are you going to have more kids? Even mm -hmm. from people who know yeah. the, what it took to have Jameson, and yeah. we have another embryo, and we absolutely will transfer him. Um, 
And while if it doesn't work, I will be incredibly devastated. Mm -hmm. I also know then that's our path for Jameson to be our only son, our only biological son. And, you know, from the beginning, Gary and I have talked about adoption, um, but having a biological son or daughter or they, (laughs) depending on where they grow up in their life, um, was what was most important. So for those who are like, why don't people just do adoption? I just don't understand. There's something in a woman. If you want to carry a child, you want to know some women want to carry their own biological child. That doesn't mean that their adopted child will be any more, any less. Mm -hmm. Just like if we decide to go that route, I wanted to be pregnant. I wanted to carry Mm -hmm. my own son. I wanted to birth my own son. Mm -hmm. I don't want to hold my own son, you know? Um, so that's why yeah. I, did. I, I think that's such an important point that you're making because that's why you went through the journey, yeah. the fertility journey. And, you know, it's easy for other women to talk to women like you and say, well, why don't you just adopt? There's lots of babies, but there's something about carrying your own biological baby. And of course, yeah. or even adopted it who are adopting embryos because their eggs and their husband's sperm are not creating them so they adopt embryos and there's still that carrying aspect there's still that situation whether it's a biological embryo or not um and yeah and there are women who say okay well i don't want to do ivf i want to go and adopt and i have mad respect for that it was my choice that i really wanted to like carry my own baby and jameson and i will now have that i'm lucky enough to have that with Jameson yeah yeah wow what a story what a journey it's really really amazing uh, to think of all of that when you think of all the different steps that you had to go through yeah from the early years of realizing this isn't happening the way we thought it would happen no yes right to laying in the operating room seeing your baby being put in there, you know, with the help of the doctors. It's so amazing. It is. It's so worth it too, right? It's so worth it. That, And I will be honest with you, by the time Jameson was born, I had to go off work and Gary's in real estate. And it was like not a good time financially for us. That end of last year when we had him was probably one of the worst financial times we had been in, in our relationship. Yeah. Uh, but again, I would spend it over and over and over again. And yeah. if like if this next embryo doesn't work, do I think I would do another retrieval? No. And not yeah. because of the burden, just because I'm going to be 40. And yeah. Yeah. I just don't see my body going through that again. Yeah. Um, yeah. Not because it was bad or good, or I just don't see my body going through that again. Yeah. Now that may change. You never know. Even though it did put you into some financial hardship. Mm-hmm. I'm so glad that you were able to do it. It. Uh, I have met women who can't afford that. There's no way they could ever afford it. And I really wish the insurance companies could reevaluate that because it is a health issue. It's a, a woman's health issue. Um, a lot of women would go that route if, if, if they, yeah. you know, had the insurance to cover it. You know, it is an employer thing as well. Um, mm-hmm. Well, yeah. Insurance companies do have it. It's just the insurance is more expensive. Um, And so employers don't opt for it. Um, Now, there are a lot of the bigger employers are. I know Johnson & Johnson will pay for it. Um, I know Procore Local will pay for it. All of it. Literally all of it. Okay, that's great. Um, So there are employers that will, and you can even search. Um, Yeah. A lot of the tech companies who really fight for their employees' rights um, will pay for it as well. Unfortunately, you weren't in a position for that. Yeah. No, wasn't. Yeah. Oh, well. Yeah. yeah. You know, I worked for a small business and it's mm-hmm. not something they could provide. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. Right. And Gary's self employed. So it just, and it's not to de- as a detriment to the my employer because. I had more, I had more support during that process than I could ever possibly imagine. Yeah. Um, and you know, now her and I are incredibly close I, yeah. because of that. 
um, cause we were before as well, but, um, you know, it's something deep to go through. Um, and there's yeah. a community in that yoga studio. And so everybody knew yeah. absolutely everything. And I wasn't, yeah. I wasn't broadcasting everything, but I definitely also wasn't hiding any of it. And so yeah. when I had pregnant the first time I let it, sh- I shouted it out. But that also meant when I found out I had a miscarriage, I then had to tell everybody I had lost the baby. Right. Yes. That's hard. Yeah. Which yes. then invites for some reason, a lot of comments about other people's miscarriages. And when you're already sad, it's hard to take on that additional sadness. And while it does yeah. make you phone, because I mean, it's one in four women, one yes. in eight, Yes. one in four, and it's one in eight women who experience infertility. And yes. those are only the reported births. So there are women wow. having before they even make it to their eight month or eight week appointment yeah. or eight to 10 weeks. When do you usually see them, Sally? Is it well, eight to we see them at uh, as, uh, like six weeks. They come in when they know they're pregnant and then we do an ultrasound around that eight week. That's what but, it is. Yeah. But yeah, we think, you know, up to 10% of those early pregnancies are lost and women sometimes don't even know they're pregnant. Yeah, and I I do you know have to go and tell women um, all the time this pregnancy didn't make it, and it's so devastating because they're there excited just like you're describing, <laughs> and it's so sad, and to go back into their community and their work and stuff, and they're grieving, they're mm-hmm. in a state of shock and grief, and yet they're expected to get back to work like the next few days or to just get on with it. Sure, it was only just a tiny, but to them, it was everything. They had all of the plans of a full, happy family life with that baby. And I understand your grief because I've seen it so many times Uh in in my patients. And I just want to reach through the screen and I just want to (laughs) hug you so tight. Yes, yes. My worry, my worry sometimes is that when we don't get over the grief of a loss, that it carries with us and then we're overprotective of the baby that we do get. Yeah. Um, I saw that in a sister of mine. She did have a baby, but it was a sudden infant death. And then the second baby, it was, it was so hard because that's still around, you know, it's, it's huh. like floats like energy. Didn't know, you know? that. Wow. A little bit, yeah. So that it's it's something that I, I'm not warning you about that, but I want you to to not lay it on your baby's shoulders. Absolutely. He, you know not that. Very. Um, yeah. It actually shared that with me, Sally, when I came in about the postpartum depression. Yeah. And I really like I understood what I fully understood what you meant. And, you know, we tell, I tell my yoga studio students, like there's a generational trauma that passes from mother to child, mother to child, yes. mother to child. And yes, I'm is, looking at her. <laughs> yes, <laughs> I did. It's so true. It's so true. My mom, the, I know everything. I know some things about my grandma and my yeah. grandparents. Stuff and you know my mom's side of the family we really don't know much yeah. um and so you know I just I tell my students all the time just remember when your shoulders and your body just feel so heavy that not yeah. only are you carrying and dealing with your own traumas you are carrying and dealing with the traumas of your past um, yeah. ancestors and so mm-hmm. I'm, I definitely I appreciated that story so much because it allowed me to be like this isn't Jameson's burden to carry and you know Bertie may has become like a light in his room i mean even last night he's teething so he's not sleeping well i was trying to get him back down and there was a flash of gold light in his room and i don't i cannot tell you where that flash of gold light came from and you know i believe i believe it's Bertie, and I've woken up with seeing her over his crib. I've seen her over me. I've seen her. She has a thing above his bed um, that my little sister made me that says her name on it. And then I have her ultrasound picture there. And the little uh, dream catcher is hanging in his uh, window in his bedroom. And so, you know, it's interesting because when I go over there, he grabs at it. He could grab at the drape 
grab at everything else around him, but he always grabs at the dream catcher. Yeah. And so they like, you know, good night, baby brother. And I say, good night, Bertie May. And, you know. But, you know, the postpartum hemorrhage was like a release. Now, whoa, now it's done. Whoa. Yeah. And but I had course, thoughts and. Yes. The placenta getting stuck was, I think, a little bit of maybe me ho- trying to hold on so dang hard to it. Yes. <laughs> um, but the thing that was when they took him, um, they had to is they had to remove the placenta and it was almost going to be like a surgery and I needed um, blood transfusions and all of that. I remember when they took him, there was a part of me that like sort of shut off Mm -hmm. um, because I was, I was afraid that he was being taken from me. Yeah. And so like, I had to like process that and like, it was okay with, he was with dad, you know, it was okay. And I, I got him back. Um, but losing that amount of blood was something else. <laughs> so scary. Wow. Yeah. 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 When he came to talk to me yeah. about the placenta and his entire arm was in me to remove it, um, I was a little bit like, okay, all right. Uh, that made- <laughs> God, it wasn't Dr. Diesfeld. That's all I have to say. He is yeah. a t- man, at least Dr. Nuss, because he is a smaller man. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> there was- a process that I had to go through to when he was taken it like mm-hmm. yeah it really took me a little bit but it's so symbolic isn't it you were still holding on the placenta wouldn't let go you were like so determined to be a mother I you was. were so determined and you did it you did. did it yeah I and did. you're such a fabulous mother and the, your Thank baby you. is just amazing He's so darn cute. I hope you send us a picture of of you guys so that we could post maybe a picture. Of- I, did, I did. She she emailed me one. I'll, I'll put it up when we're of oh good oh this. good yeah great yeah that one was from Father's Day so oh and he's curious and he's um he's not scared of anything he wants to like crawl on everything and climb and um do a lot of pull-ups he really you know (laughs) wow (laughs) thanks so much for sharing his journey as well as your journey it's both of your journey and it's such a hard journey you know coming towards each other from different places like you know he's coming out of where where does he come from you know his little spirit somehow finds his way into your yeah egg and the sperm and at that moment he comes it's such a beautiful thing I, I know I tried calling Bridget you know early in my marriage and my story was totally different I got pregnant really quickly but I remember wanting to be pregnant like I know that feeling I'm like okay now it's time everything's Aww. set up I'm in a beautiful happy place and I did yoga on a big rock out down at the beach in Santa Barbara. And I did the deepest back bend I think I ever did right there, you know, opening to the ocean. And I was calling, her, you know, baby, come, I'm ready. And I went home and I'm sure I got pregnant that night. <laughs> <laughs> I love but that's, that. That's, that's what she the says. opposite <laughs> end, you know. That's right. The, and I know that women can't help but tell their stories to you, you know. That's our, that's what we do to each other. Every single story is important. We have to make room for them all. Like Bridget's journey coming through that back bend means <laughs> much. You know, whether or not it did, I know <laughs> it means it as much as Jameson's story. You know, there are women out there that have reoccurring losses and don't end up with any embryos out of their IVF process. Just because I did IVF and got pregnant off the first time does not mean that the next woman will have this IVF or that my next pregnancy will even work. That the right. next will work. We don't know. Yeah. There's no way to guarantee it. For, for people that are women that are possibly also struggling with this, what would you like advise to them going through yeah. something similar? Cause every story is different, but. Um, that if they believe that they are meant to, carry a child to not stop because 
you know, and then I say that and I have a friend who really believes she's meant to carry a child and there is absolutely no way it will ever happen for her. Um, yeah, so yeah, it's so hard to give advice because it is so different and I don't want to say keep believing or, um, just keep trying or stop trying or et cetera, because yeah, like you really just, there's no predict it or to know and just know I guess just to know that they're not alone and to reach out to a community because it's not something that you can carry on your own I'm so thankful for the women I have met uh in the journey because so don't try to do it alone yeah that would be my um yeah my thing if there are women listening that want my information and they email it to you please give or email you asking please give it to them because yeah that's my story, but it's not, it will never become a judgment of somebody else's story or um, a jealousy of somebody else's story or, 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 because like I said, they all, every single babies, every single person, every single soul, all of it, all of it matters. Um, yeah. So Nicole, you are strong. You are <laughs> wise. You are woman. You are mother. <laughs> You are so beautiful and so amazing. And I really, really appreciate this story. Thank you. Thank you've you so touched, much. You've touched me deeply. And, like, and I have so many women with various types of stories. But, you know, I, I am so grateful for this story. Thank you. And I'm going to share it with everyone. <laughs> yeah, fun. thank you for... for you know, being vulnerable with us and sharing it to, you know, people that we don't even know who's listening. And I yeah. think that's really brave of you as well. Yeah. Thank you. Thank yeah. You. I think yeah. we, us all women, <laughs> a platform to speak about our stories because yeah. that is what helps. So thanks again for listening. We really appreciate it. And um, if you like what we're doing, give us a bit of a review on Apple. That would help us so much. And um, if you come across a subscribe button, press the subscribe button. It doesn't cost you anything. 